Uh, hi there, this video is a uh, follow-up to two videos from Paul Flynn that he put out recently talking about his um, conversion or, or uh, decision away from computer baptism towards computer baptism and, and uh, explaining his rationale behind that. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things since he specifically uh, interacted with 1689 federalism. Uh, not to the degree that I was hoping he would, but uh, he at least mentioned it and, and played a, a little bit of the videos. Um, so I just wanted to try to follow up real briefly here before I go to bed, try to squeeze this in. Um, but yeah, thank you, Paul, for posting the videos. You know, I agree that uh, uh, study of covenant theology is a very rewarding study. Uh, and so I just I, I thank you for the opportunity and the encouragement you've given others to really dive into the issue because it is worth their time. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I wish you had interacted a little bit more with 1689 federalism. A lot of it was you, you know, kind of explaining your position, um, which is understandable, but you know, we'd like to see a little more interaction with the arguments that we've presented. Um, you did mention that you said it was, you found it very confusing. You found 1689 federalism very confusing. And you mentioned that it might be um, just just because you hadn't studied enough or, or fully understood it. And um, personally, I would agree with that assessment. You demonstrated several misunderstandings in your videos about our position. And um, you know, I apologize, we haven't made it easier to understand. We're doing everything we can to, to help people understand what it is. Some, some things just require diligent study. Um, it's the same with you know, the Westminster Federalism it requires very diligent study to understand its position as well. Um, but, uh, so my apologies we weren't clear, but I did want to address a few of the, the misunderstandings. I think the biggest one, the foundational misunderstanding, is, is our view of the uh, promise and established covenant of grace. Uh, I think you kind of misunderstood what we mean by that there. Um, and uh, you, you basically said that uh, our position was that the covenant of grace did not exist in time and space until Christ came. And that before that, uh, people were saved through the covenant of redemption. That's not at all our position. I'll get into that in a moment. But um, I want to address one of the other things you said. You, you mentioned that in line with that, that it is wrong to make the covenant of grace the outworking of the covenant of redemption in time. Because if you do that and you equate the or limit the covenant of grace to being able to be elect alone, um, the problem with that is you'll end up a Baptist. Um, that's kind of begging the question. That's not really an argument against our position to say that you'll end up with our position if you adopt a, a certain view. Um, but it's probably not what you mean, but it is you know, what we said, if I heard you correctly. Um, but the other issue there is you, know, you need to take a look at uh, the Westminster standards a little more closely. Uh, Westminster Larger Catechism question 31 says, With whom was the covenant of grace made? And he answers, The covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam, and in him with all the elect as his seed. So, you know, if your objection is that we shouldn't view the covenant of grace as an outworking of the covenant of redemption in time, because we shouldn't limit the covenant of grace to the elect only, uh, you may want to revisit your standards and figure out what exactly they mean there and, and how to understand that and fit it with your understanding. Uh, Meredith Klein commented on this and he said, through its failure to distinguish satisfactorily the two very different arrangements in the redemptive order, he's referring to the covenant of grace and the covenant of redemption, and the resultant blurring together of contradictory elements, the one covenant construction of A.A. A. Hodge and the Westminster Confession and Catechism has at least uh, at least these liabilities. It leads to a definition of the covenant community, church, in baptistic terms as consisting of believers or the elect, contrary to the Presbyterian doctrine that the church consists of those who profess Christian faith and their children. So I understand what you're getting at, but there is some um, ambiguity within the Westminster Standards on that point, and I'll provide a link in the uh, disc video description to Klein's quote there, as well as some quotes from Mark Carlberg. Uh, about inherent tension and in the uh, standards that, in his opinion, he, he thinks needs to be worked out. Um, 
But the, uh, the point you made, the other point you made about 1689 federalism with their view, um, what, what you understood as our understanding of the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace, um, is that uh, you felt that it would logically lead to eternal justification, the, the view, uh, doctrine known as eternal justification. Um, but you have misunderstood our position. We don't believe that people um, prior to the coming of Christ were saved through the covenant of redemption as opposed to the covenant of grace. Um, you know, we believe that all men throughout all of history have been saved through the covenant of grace. Um, in uh, the book that came out a few months ago called Recovery and a Covenantal Heritage, Samuel and Michael Renahan have a chapter in there that's it's excellent. If you're having a hard time understanding 1689 federalism, that chapter, uh, it's at the end of the book. It, it is an excellent summary presentation of what 1689 federalism believes. Uh, I highly recommend reading it. It just came out on uh, Kindle this week for $9.99. Um, and in that, they state the covenant of grace is the inbreaking of the covenant of redemption into history through the progressive revelation and retroactive application of the new covenant. All right, so just to clarify what our position is. Um, so with that clarification in mind, the question of eternal justification um, is no longer a concern. We believe that you know the elect are chosen in Christ in the covenant of redemption, and then that redemption is applied to believers, like you said, using through the means, uh, when they come to faith, those benefits are applied to them, uh, and so the they they enter the you could say they enter the covenant of redemption through election, and uh, believers enter the covenant of grace through effectual call through the effectual call. Um, And then just to clarify what exactly we mean when we talk about the covenant of grace promised versus the covenant of grace established, uh, you said that uh, you said what they mean by the covenant of grace promised is that it's not yet in time and space. That's not really accurate. Um, what we're talking about, well, let me just quote Owen here. Um, he says, this is the meaning of the word established, say we, but it is reduced into a fixed state of a law or ordinance. All the obedience required in it all the worship appointed by it, all the privileges exhibited in it, and the grace administered with them are all given for a statute, law, and ordinance under the church. That which lay hid in promises and many things obscure, the principal mysteries of it being a secret hid in God himself, was now brought to light. And that covenant, which had invisibly, in the way of a promise, put forth its efficacy under types and shadows, was now solemnly sealed, ratified, and confirmed in the death and resurrection of Christ. It had before the confirmation of a promise, which is an oath. It had now the confirmation of a covenant, which is blood. That which before had no visible outward worship, proper and peculiar to it, is now made the only rule and instrument of worship under the whole church. Uh, nothing being to, uh, being to be admitted therein, but what belongs unto it and is appointed by it. And he continues on, if reconciliation and salvation by Christ were to be obtained not only under the old covenant, but by virtue thereof, then it must be the same for substance with the new. But this is not so, for no reconciliation with God nor salvation could be obtained by virtue of the old covenant or the administration of it, as our apostle disputes at large. Though all believers were reconciled, justified, and saved by virtue of the promise, whilst they were under the old covenant. So it's not that we don't believe that the covenant of grace exists in time and space and we're working from the covenant of redemption. No, we believe it's working in time and space, but, but as a promise that is yet to be formally established as a covenant with its own uh, form of worship and ordinances legally established. That's the idea that we're getting here. And, um, apologize if I'm speaking too fast here. Uh, just trying to get through this and I'll link to a bunch of stuff um, if you're of you are interested where you can read this a little more closely. Um, you mentioned, you know, in this regard, you mentioned uh, covenant theology existing in the early church. Uh, what's pretty interesting is if you take a look at Augustine, he's saying the same thing that we are about the old covenant and the new covenant um, in, in terms of it working, you know, uh, retroactively. Uh, he says, and then the law of works, which was written on the tables of stone, and its reward, the land of promise, 
which the house of the carnal Israel after their liberation from Egypt received, belong to the Old Covenant. So the law of faith written on the heart and its reward, the beatific vision, which the house of the spiritual Israel, when delivered from the present world, shall uh, perceive, belong to the New Covenant. The children of the promise, Romans 9, 8, reborn of God, who have obeyed the commands by faith working through love, Galatians 5, 6, have belonged to the new covenant since the world began. The happy persons, who even in that early age were by the grace of God taught to understand the distinction now set forth, were thereby made the children of promise, and were accounted in the secret purpose of God as heirs of the new covenant. And then he argues from Jeremiah 31, saying, All these predestinated, called, justified, glorified ones shall know God by the grace of the new covenant, from the least to the greatest of them. Uh, so I'll link there to the, the full um, essay there from uh, Augustine, but it's pretty interesting because that's basically 1689 federalism in a nutshell. Um, trying to get through this quickly here. You mentioned excommunication. Um, and you say it just doesn't make any sense from a Baptist perspective. Well, to start with, you're assuming that the covenant of grace is equivalent to the visible church, and therefore you don't understand how somebody can be uh, excommunicated from the visible church without being excommunicated from the covenant of grace. Like much of what you present in your video, you're assuming a position when you're bringing in and then arguing from that assumption. Uh, we don't assume that the covenant of grace is synonymous with the visible church. Um, and so it's just, that's just not a problem um, to believe that the covenant of grace consists only of the elect. The visible church is those who profess faith. It's two different things. Um, the visible church should approximate the covenant of grace. That should be the aim. That's why we only admit those who profess faith, because that's uh, the sign that they have uh, true faith and are in the invisible church. But the two are not the same. Um, and our confession affirms the distinction between the visible and invisible church. Uh, the confusion there is that it, it does so a little bit differently. Um, and I have a post called Church Membership De Jure or De Facto that uh, I think will do a good job of at least helping you understand the different way that we're looking at uh, the visible church and hopefully can clarify some misunderstanding there. Um, in this context, you mentioned uh, Romans 9, 6. They're not all... Israel that are of Israel. And again, you're bringing to that text your assumption regarding the covenant of grace and the inward and outward um, membership in the covenant of grace. Uh, I don't believe that's what the text is saying. We don't believe that's what the text is saying. We believe it's a distinction between typical Israel and anti-typical Israel, between uh, the nation of Israel and spiritual Israel, between Abraham's physical seed and his spiritual seed. Uh, and that's the way that Augustine interpreted that as well. And I'll post a link to an article I recently wrote uh, explaining uh, Romans 9, 6 in that regard. Um, and in this context, you also mentioned the olive tree. Once again, I would say that you were bringing an assumption to that text and then arguing from that assumption. You're saying that the olive tree is the visible church. Well, the text itself doesn't say that. Uh, it, the text itself says that Israel is the olive tree, and then you're making the assumption, or, or the connection based on your assumption, that therefore it's referring to the visible church. We don't make that connection, therefore it's unwarranted. Uh, and we believe that uh, there's a lot of misinterpretation of the olive tree by Pato Baptist. And again, I'll link to my uh, article explaining how to properly understand the olive tree with Abraham as the root and, and Israel as the tree itself. Um, you mentioned the fact that uh, the Bible refers to various covenants as, as an everlasting covenant. Uh, you said the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant is called an everlasting covenant. That means it's going to continue until the end of time. Well, uh, technically, that's not necessarily what the word means. It can mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. Uh, there are a variety of, of uh, meanings to apply to that one word. It can refer to something in the past, it can refer to something only in the future, um, but one of the possible interpretations of that word translated everlasting is also the word uh, perpetual. Um, perpetual is defined as continuing forever or for a very long time without stopping. Um, and what's interesting is 
Uh, if you look at the ESV, for example, in Exodus 40:15, it refers to the Levitical priesthood as a perpetual covenant. And that's important because uh, the Levitical priesthood comes to an end. It, it no longer continues. He mentioned there's a type-antitype relationship. I can mention that in a minute. But the Levit Levitical priesthood comes to an end, and yet Exodus 40.15 refers to it as being established through a perpetual or everlasting covenant. It's the same word there that is used in Genesis uh, 17 to refer to the everlasting covenant. Um, the Translators of the ESV chose to use everlasting in Genesis 17 and perpetual in Leviticus, meaning that it's contextually determined. Uh, if you look at the New English translation, the NET Bible, uh, which is good for um, different textual variant notes and things like that, they, they translate uh, Genesis 17 as perpetual covenant as well. Um, so the word in and of itself certainly does not establish one position or another. Uh, context determines the meaning. Um, in this respect, there's a helpful quote from Gregory Nichols. He said, um, referring to the land of Canaan, its description as everlasting was also applied to other temporary institutions. The word translated everlasting in Genesis 17.8 literally means until the distant future. Often it does signify forever and ever, for example, Deuteronomy 33.27 and Psalm 92, but not always. Context must determine its duration. Scripture uses this very word to describe the duration of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16.34, and of the Aaronic Priesthood, Exodus 29.28 and 40.15. Scripture indicates explicitly that these other Old co Covenant institutions terminate with the coming of Messiah. His coming is their vanishing point, the end of the age. Similarly, in Genesis 17.8, uh, the Hebrew word signifies until the distant future, throughout the entire era of Hebrew uh, Israel's theocracy. That era lasted a very long time, some 1,500 years, until the promised Messiah came to institute the new, uh, the new covenant. Uh, so the word in and of itself doesn't establish one, one view or another, and it's completely consistent with uh, what we put forward. Um, I also want to mention you, you addressed the Levitical priesthood, and you said that uh, you acknowledge that it's a, an everlasting covenant to establish the priesthood, and then you tried to argue that it continues to be everlasting because we are the anti-type of the Levitical priesthood. First of all, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, but secondarily, if you're granting that something can remain everlasting when it comes to an end and its anti-type continues, then you have no objection to our position, uh, which deals entirely with typology. Um, you mentioned the, the issue of works in the Mosaic Covenant. And you mentioned how incredibly confused the Baptist position is there. I'll just note that the Mosaic Covenant is a confusing issue. It's not limited to Baptists. You seem to be unfamiliar with the republication debate um, that's raging right now in the OPC, um, where they're, in their general assembly, they're going to decide if it's a viable um, view within their confession because there are a tremendous amount of people who do view uh, a works principle for the land within the OPC, within Pado baptist denominations. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, Brenton Ferry's thesis. I can't remember how long. It's very long. Um, it's titled, Works in the Mosaic Covenant, a Reformed Taxonomy. And he tries to categorize all the different ways that Reformed Pado baptists have addressed and tried to make sense of the works principle within the Mosaic Covenant. And it, you know, he just winds up with so many different categories trying to explain it. Um, this is hardly limited to Baptist. It's a complex and confusing issue that no matter what side you land on, you have to wrestle with. Um, you mentioned Jeremiah 31, uh, that this is a, a huge problem with our use of uh, all shall know me. You know, I mentioned Augustine already. He interpreted Jeremiah 31 in the same way that we do, meaning that it was limited to the elect, that it's the way that people have always been saved since the beginning of the world. Um, and, um, and you mentioned John Brown's interpretation of it there. I would just encourage you to go reread what Owen says because he addresses the objections here. He's aware of them. John Brown, I think you mentioned, was, was a contemporary there of Owen. Um, and you know, Owen interpreted that Jeremiah 31 passage in, in terms of they shall all know me and, and no longer teach uh, one his neighbor, know the Lord. He interpreted the same way that we do, and he, exp 
uh, answers the objections there. It's, it goes on for several pages, so I'd encourage you to go back and, and read Owen on that. Um, and then you said that our interpretation of this passage wasn't possible because uh, believers in the Old Covenant had the law written on their heart. And that, that's kind of what you ended your video with, and that objection there really tells me that you haven't even really understood our position because our, our whole point is that yes, believers under the Old Covenant had the law written on their hearts, but the Old Covenant had no power to do that. That power comes from the New Covenant working retroactively. That's the way Owen described it, and that's um, the way we hold it, and that's, as I said, that's how Augustine described it as well. Um, you mentioned that uh, seeing two covenants in Abraham, one for land and one for spiritual blessings, is very inconsistent. Um, so the idea of recognizing two roles for Abraham, one spiritual and, and one uh, regarding the coming of the Messiah and the land and things like that, and, and that there are two seeds of Abraham, one carnal, one spiritual, and each are devoted to each of those privileges differently. That's entirely inconsistent. I'll just point out that uh, throughout history, there are many Pado baptists who have held that exact view. And what's very interesting is that they, they do that when the, when the Pado baptists are pressed each time regarding uh, church discipline. When church discipline becomes an issue, and the purity of the church becomes an issue, and they are pressed uh, by those who advocate a national church, they fall back on making this distinction because those who advocate a national church and, um, and, and don't want to purify the church as much as it should be uh, by many people into it who shouldn't be there, they justify it on the grounds of the Mosaic Covenant, of the Old Covenant. And so Paedo-Baptists throughout history have pressed back and said, no, you have to understand there are two seeds in Abraham, two covenants that establish two different principles. And so Owen is one, Jonathan Edwards is another, dealing with the halfway covenant in New England. John Erskine, uh, an 18th century Scottish Presbyterian, dealing with the Scottish National Church, objecting to problems there, is another one. Uh, Charles Hodge in America, he was um, being pressed by Episcopalians, um, arguing from the Mosaic Covenant, and he pressed back <clears throat> in, a, in a great uh, answer, explaining that he says, you must remember that there are two covenants in Abraham with two seeds, and you can't confuse the two. Um, anyways, I'll provide a link to explaining each of those as, uh, as well, if you want to read up on that. Um, you mentioned baby dedications as a huge inconsistency with Reformed Baptists. Um, I agree. That's uh, My church that I, I go to doesn't practice that, and Richard Barcelos has... Uh, an excellent booklet uh, explaining why it's unbiblical and churches should not practice it. Um, you talked about, uh, in your first video, you explained the meaning of seals from a Reformed Peter Baptist perspective, um, referring to seals as, you know, the king's guarantee, the king's seal on something. And then you answered the issue with baptism by uh, quoting Calvin as, as explaining that um, a seal doesn't signify or seal anything if the document is empty, meaning if someone doesn't have faith, their baptism doesn't seal anything. Uh, I would, you know, I would simply push back and say, what on earth is a king doing sealing an empty document? That really kind of devalues um, you know, the, the value and the worth of a king's seal, which carries great weight. Um, a king would be kind of out of his mind if he's running around placing that seal on empty documents and sending those around uh, his kingdom. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. And I recognize you appeal to Romans 4 to, to justify and explain that, uh, your understanding of, of the seal, but uh, you know, we believe that you have misunderstood Romans 4. It does not establish a principle for <clears throat> believers and their children throughout um, all covenantal periods. The context of Romans 4 is specifically dealing with one person that's dealing with Abraham and using him as an example for the specific question of how Gentiles can be justified through faith. Um, it's not making a comment on the covenant sign to all who are in the covenant. It's specifically talking about Abraham. A.W. Pink states as well, he says, the next thing we would observe is that circumcision was a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. Again, we would say, let us be on our guard against adding to God's word, for nowhere does scripture say that circumcision was a seal to anyone but to Abraham himself. 
and even in his case, so far was it from communicating any spiritual blessing, it simply confirmed what was already promised to him. As a seal from God, circumcision was a divine pledge or guarantee that from him should issue the seed, that seed, which would bring blessing to all nations, and that on the same terms as justifying righteousness had become his by faith alone. It was not a seal of his faith, but of that righteousness which, in due time, was to be wrought out by the Messiah and mediator. Circumcision was not a memorial of anything which had already been actualized, but an earnest of what uh, was yet future, namely, of that justifying righteousness which was to be brought by Christ. So yes, this was a seal. This was a king's confirmation that this will happen. And it was a confirmation that Christ will come from Abraham. That's what it was sealing. That seal, circumcision, was not a seal right, to Abraham's offspring. It was a seal to Abraham, confirming the promise of God that the Messiah would come from him. Um, and so we would believe that it devalues the meaning of a seal as a guarantee uh, to apply it, to use it for baptism. We would say that the, um, uh, the seal of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit, the guarantee, uh, guarantee of the new covenant. Um, and the uh, L London Baptist, they addressed this in the Second London Baptist Confession in an appendix uh, where they interact with and quote uh, Dr. John Lightfoot from the Westminster Assembly in defense of their view and, and interact with it a bit. So take a look at that as well. Um, let's see, you mentioned uh, you know Colossians 2. That's a standard go-to text. I would recommend reading Richard Barcello's a very technical exegesis of that passage in uh, the book I mentioned already, Recovering a Covenantal Heritage, that came out uh, a couple months ago. Uh, it's on Kindle as of this week for $9.99. Uh, excellent chapter there addressing Colossians 2 in a very technical manner. And likewise, there are two chapters from uh, Gemma and Hubner addressing uh, Acts 2.39 in a very technical manner and demonstrating that uh, the Pado Baptist history of interpretation of there is, is quite poor, uh, a number of exegetical mistakes. Um, so I highly recommend taking a look at that as well. Um, and you, you mentioned the Baptist view doesn't make sense in Acts 2 uh, because it wouldn't make sense to a covenant Jew. But that's just question making. You're assuming the covenant Jew would have your understanding of the Abrahamic covenant in mind. So once again, you're importing an assumption into a text and then arguing from your assumption. Um, I thought there were a few uh, inconsistencies that you mentioned um, uh, from, from your perspective you put forward, uh, I'll just interact with a couple here. You said that um, it would be inaccurate to say that the difference between the Old and the New Covenant is just about outward appearances. Uh, well, what we're getting at there is that uh, the distinction there, the Reformed distinction, is between substance and accidents. Right? So any difference is accidental. It ha doesn't have to do with the substance. But you tried to argue that the blessings are greater. And one of the blessings you argued specifically was that now we have Christ interceding for us at the right hand of God instead of Moses interceding for us. Now, if that's just a change in the accidents, I mean, what on earth is the substance if Christ's intercession for us is not the substance, right? If the change is, is, is an accident and who our intercessor is is an accident, whereas in the old covenant it was Moses and now it's Christ, I mean, how on earth can you have the same covenant with those two different mediators? That's one of the objections that Owen brings up and says there have to, they have to be two different test, um, covenants because they have two different mediators, right? If Christ was not, inter, uh, was not interceding for Old Testament believers, how are they saved from their sin? How are they sanctified? How are their prayers answered if Christ was not interceding for them? We would answer that Christ was through the power of the new covenant working retroactively. Um... And you mentioned that Moses was a type of Christ. Well, yeah, but the type is not the thing signified. Um, and so there is a difference in substance there between Moses as mediator and Christ as mediator. Um, the other thing was you talked about how Baptists treat their children and, and versus how Pado baptists treat their children. And this is a, a, a big inconsistency that we've seen with Pado baptists um, because, let's see, you, you object, you object that Baptists treat their children like lost unbelievers, 
And yet you are also very adamant that you teach your children that they must be born again. And you don't assume that they are. Well, the issue is binary. You're either in Christ or you're not. You're either lost in unbelief, dead in Adam, and in need of regeneration and need to be born again, or you're born again and you don't need to be born again. But you've presented this situation where, no, they're not, we should not consider them lost in Adam, but we also should not consider them born again. You can't create this magical third option. It's binary. It's one or the other. Your solution is to say, well, we consider them part of the visible church. That doesn't answer the question. If you consider them part of the visible church, you consider them born again. That's why paedo baptism continually falls back upon presumptive regeneration throughout history. Right? That's a consistent testimony because it's, it's either or. You can't create this magical third category where they're not considered lost in Adam and they're not considered born again in Christ. Um, The, let's see, kind of in closing here, I was sort of waiting on pins and needles to hear these huge inconsistencies with 1689 federalism that you uh, alluded to, and I, I just didn't hear them in your presentation. Um, maybe I missed them, but you know, I'd love to hear them. I don't want to hold to any inconsistencies. I you know, believe every position must be logical, and an inconsistency, a, a contradiction is... Uh, means the position can't be held, and I don't want to hold to something that's inconsistent. I just didn't hear these these huge, strong inconsistencies that that you thought uh, you found in 1689 federalism. Um, but I, you know, I don't I don't want to get overly polemic here. I appreciate what you've brought forward, and you know, this is a good opportunity for us to dig into the scripture more, and and hopefully this is you know a means of sharpening one another and, and edifying those who view the videos, and um, that's. You know, the vein in which I, I present this here, I don't mean to um, become overly polemic, and I know this can be a heated issue. Uh, I just want to close with a comment on hermeneutics. You said, if you start from Genesis and work forward in a consistent way, I believe you will come to these convictions. But if you go the wrong way down a one-way street, that is, if you start with the New Testament, come with an understanding and work backwards into the Old Testament, that is the wrong way. The, uh, the way you will look at this issue determines which way you will go. Excuse me. If you do work backwards, you will be a Baptist. There's no doubt about it. Wow, I agree with you completely. Um, and I think that you're wrong regarding the proper hermeneutic. And I think you're actually, Pado Baptists are just, Reformed Pado Baptists are just inconsistent on this point because they recognize what the proper hermeneutic is. Um, I would say you should start in Genesis and read forward, and when you get to the New Testament, then you should turn around and read backwards to properly understand what you read in the Old Testament. Um, Sam and Michael Renahan in the Recovering the Covenantal Heritage that I've mentioned before, uh, they say the following, any Reformed theologian speaking of hermeneutics will agree that the New Testament is the lens through which we must interpret the Old Testament. Usually the famous saying attributed to Augustine is quoted, the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. So, on every other issue, Reformed theologians recognize you interpret the old in light of the new, not the other way around. So you don't start at Genesis and just read straight forward. When you get to the New Testament, you turn around and better understand or reinterpret what you just read in the Old Testament. Um, Pado baptism is the only issue they don't do. Uh, and to prove the point, there's a great quote from Kim Riddlebarger. He was interviewed on a Crisis Center podcast about... Um, on millennialism and dispensationalism. And he said, the problem uh, with dispensationalism is that when you're using a Christ-centered hermeneutic, you don't start with Genesis 12 and look at the promise God made to Abraham and then insist that that reading of the promise overrides everything that comes subsequent to that. So for example, the land promise in Genesis 12, and it's repeated throughout 15, 18, 22, on and on and on. When that land promise is repeated, dispensationalists say, see, that must mean Israel means Israel, and that God is going to save Israel again to fulfill the land promise at the end of the age. Whereas I would look at that and say, how did Jesus and the apostles look at the land promise? How did Jesus and the apostles look at the Abrahamic covenant? And that is at the heart of this entire debate. I completely, really, uh, completely agree with him. I think his words apply exactly to our situation here. If he is consistent, uh, he will not hold to your hermeneutic that you've put forward, he would hold to a Baptist hermeneutic, and 
like you said, there's no doubt about it, he would end up a Baptist. Uh, to paraphrase Riddle Barger, the problem with paedobaptism is when you're using a Christ-centered hermeneutic, you don't start with Genesis 17 and look at the promise God made to Abraham and then insist that that reading of the promise overrides everything that comes subsequent to that. So, for example, the offspring promise in Genesis 17, and it's repeated throughout 12, 15, 22, on and on and on. When that offspring promise is repeated, Paedobaptists say, see, that must mean offspring means offspring, and that God included physical offspring in the church and never took them out. Whereas I would look at them and say, how did Jesus and the apostles look at the offspring promise? How did Jesus and the apostles look at the Abrahamic covenant? And that is at the heart of this entire debate. I agree. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for this opportunity to discuss these truths. Um, you know, praise God that he's saved us through his son, through the new covenant. Um, and just thank you for this opportunity. Have a good night.